electrification's the fashion at present, even for MPV buyers. Well, here's one you might like. If you can afford the higher asking price and can cope with the 172 mile driving range, then there aren't too many other downsides in opting for the fully electric Peugeot e-Rifter, the only Rifter variant now on offer. It certainly might be a tempting option if you're looking for a full electric compact family car and don't want a compact SUV. Here there's the option of a seven-seater cabin too, which is rare to find in an EV at present except with the Citroen and Vauxhall models that share this one's design. The segment for compact people carriers has recently gained something of a fresh lease of life, courtesy of EV Power, and what used to be called the PSA Group has doggedly continued to sell small MPVs as sales in this sector have declined and now may reap the benefit, with fully electrified versions of the Citroen Berlingo, the Vauxhall Combo, and the subject of this test, Peugeot's e-Rifter. As with those two in-house rivals, it gets the 50 kilowatt hour battery that Peugeot, Citroen and Vauxhall seem to fit to every EV they make, even the biggest MPVs. Here, of course, a battery of that size is far more appropriate and it's been built into the car in a way that doesn't compromise cabin space. Sounds interesting. So what's it like? Well, you sit quite high and SUV-like in front of a 10-inch instrument screen that unusually you view over the steering wheel rim rather than through it. Pressing the start button gets you a beep and a green ready message on the display ahead. You're ready for MPV motoring electric style. Unlike some EVs, this one doesn't spring away from rest in a flurry of torque. It's all much more linear and combustion-like, whichever of the available drive modes you select. There are three, Eco, Normal and Power, and you won't want to spend too long in Eco unless you really are eking out battery capacity because it reduces the powertrain's normal 134 bhp output to just 80 bhp and also restricts the climate system to conserve power. Peugeot suggests that you do most of your driving in the normal setting, which increases the motor output to 107 bhp. The top power mode isn't really intended for sporty driving, but for situations when you're carrying heavy loads. The powertrain also has a B setting, which increases the level of regenerative braking to a point where the car slows so much when you come off the throttle that you'll very rarely need to use the brake unless you're coming to a complete stop. Other than that, there's not too much to get used to in driving an e-Rifter. The little steering wheel feels completely at odds with the car's utilitarian vibe and tall, tippy shape. You certainly wouldn't be encouraged in any way to go throwing the thing around, even if you were late for the school play or had left dinner burning in the oven. Anyway, that would decimate your driving range, which is claimed at 172 miles for this standard length model, around 30 miles less than the full electric Vauxhall Corsa and Peugeot 208 Super Minis that also use this battery. But it's much closer to the range figure of the Citroen EC4, which also uses it. Like all electric vehicles, this one has a bit of a weight problem. That drivetrain adds over 300 kilos of bulk, but that arguably helps the e-Rifter when it comes to ride quality. You'll feel things like speed bumps keenly, but at speed on the open road, it handles tarmac tears a little better than its combustion cousins. This e-Rifter feels really at home in an urban environment, surprisingly really, because it's quite a large car, especially in long wheelbase form. But you'll feel really confident in it on the school run because all round visibility is great. The steering is light and, as we've said, the suspension deals with porous surfaces quite well. Parking's easy because rear sensors and a reversing camera are standard fit across the range. There's very little outward differentiation to identify this particular Rifter's all-electric status. Unless you notice the lack of tailpipes and the addition of a charging flap, extra badging and trim accents are the only giveaways. 
you'll really need the extra embellishments of the top GT trim level we have here, though, if you want to distract the attention of passers-by from the fact that all you've actually really got here is a Peugeot partner van with extra seats and windows. This distinctive Peugeot family nose borrows from the sharky look pioneered by the second generation 508 and plusher models like this one feature halogen headlamps incorporating these distinctive angled LED daytime running light strips and this 3D stamped effect black radiator grille. This GT spec also gets you 17 inch Aoraki alloy wheels plus front and rear scuff plates and door sill protectors with gloss black inserts for that SUV look. It all creates a chunky Tonka toy type vibe suggesting that this Rifter might be up for the odd adventure. As with a Peugeot partner van you get a choice of wheelbases, standard length which is what we've got here or a long length version, the latter's 350 millimetres of extra body length enabling the fitment of a third row of seats. Now, like its Vauxhall and Citroen cousins, this car sits on the Stellantis Group's EV compatible eCMP platform. At the back, it's pretty van-like, though Peugeot has tried to dilute that feeling by adding in smart claw effect LED rear tail lamps and a rather unconvincing silvered lower skid plate strip. They've also specified this model with a one-piece tailgate rather than the asymmetrically opening twin rear doors you'd get on the commercial van version of this design. Right, let's take a look inside. At the wheel, at first glance anyway, it's much as in the old combustion-powered conventional Rifter, or indeed a Peugeot partner van. That means that there's the brand's usual eye cockpit design, which uses this much smaller than normal little three-spoke wheel. You view the dials over the top of its rim rather than conventionally through its spokes. And this design approach works rather better in this Rifter than it does in some of Peugeot's more usual car models, thanks to this MPV's upright driving position and tall fascia. Yes, it's a bit of a culture shock. Yes, you'll eventually get to like it. And yes, you should ignore whinging journalists who don't. Mm. Once you've got used to that, if you look a little closer around, you'll start to see some of this EV variant's model specific differences. This little EV drive toggle switch, for instance, that takes the place of the usual gear selector. And of course, there are EV specific features on both of the provided displays. Let's start with the 10-inch instrument screen you view above the wheel rim, which in its standard layout has a battery indicator on the left, a digital speedo in the middle, and a power eco charge drive meter on the right. Using this little rotary controller on the left-hand steering wheel spoke, you can alter the screen layout through various settings. Energy, dials, driving, navigation, minimal and personal. Whatever you choose, the resolution is sharply defined and easy to read. Which can't really also be said for the central 8-inch infotainment display. Still, at least it has a physical volume dial and, more importantly, it's not burdened with the climate controls, which are separated out further down the centre stack. And it offers easy access to DAB radio stations, hands-free phone connectivity and media streaming via Bluetooth or a USB connection. Plus, there's smartphone mirroring via the Android Auto or Apple CarPlay systems, and you can pay extra for 3D navigation if you want it. There's a bespoke EV section for this e-rifter, which has flow, statistics and charge sections. Enough with screens. What else? Well, if your perception of van-based MPV motoring is of something quite utilitarian, and you might be rather pleasantly surprised by the cabin quality that's served up here. Yes, most of the interior fittings are of the hard, scratchy kind, but you do also get a few soft-touch plastics and little touches of chrome. Plus, this top GT version has this lovely stitched leather wheel and these copper-coloured dash and door panel inserts, which together lift the interior quite a lot. Overall, though, the prevailing ambience is still perhaps appropriately one of wipe-clean practicality. 
We've saved arguably the best bit, though, till last, cabin practicality. If you were to add up the capacity of all the 28 different nooks and crannies available within the interior of this rifter, you'd arrive at a figure of 167 litres, about as much as you'd get in the entire boot of some city cars. Not all of the areas provided are that useful. Anything placed in the areas behind the centre screen and in front of the instrument display are going to slide about annoyingly, as it will in the wide, narrow recess below this upper-mounted glove box. There's no lower glove box, just open storage in the space where you'd expect to find it, halved in size in this right-hand drive model by the adjacent fuse box. There's a cup holder at either end of the dash top, and a useful stowage area for your phone is provided beneath the climate controls on the centre stack. Next to it is a small circular recess, useless for anything on continental spec cars. It houses a rotary controller for the grip control system that isn't offered here. The storage place you'll be using most is this simply huge covered lidded box between the seats, incorporating a somewhat hidden 12 volt socket. Right, enough on what the front of the cabin's like. Let's take a seat in the second row. Now, both short and long wheelbase e-rifter models offer access to this part of the car via these sliding side doors. And these are so much more practical than the conventionally opening items that kids so often use to dent and scratch adjoining vehicles in tightly packed car parks. The sliding doors are rather heavy to close from the inside, and this format means you can't have door pockets either. Still, on the plus side, this second row offers enough space to suit a wide variety of passenger shapes and sizes. Now, because the battery pack is mounted beneath this MPV model's floor, cabin space is not compromised at all over comparable combustion-engined rifter models. So, there are vast standards of headroom, and because the centre transmission tunnel is virtually non-existent, it's straightforward to accommodate three fully-sized adults if need be. If you're able to stretch to this top-spec GT level of trim, you'll get the three individual rear seats that really ought to be optional further down the range. With base Allure premium spec, though, you'll be stuck with the conventional fixed bench, which really doesn't do very much at all, unable to slide or recline in the way you'd hope an MPV model rear seat might. All e-rifters get these aircraft-style seatback tables with cup holder points, but you don't get the useful underfloor storage compartments that used to feature on the old combustion models. Blame the bulky EV powertrain below you for that. Twin vents are provided back here, and you get a separate climate control if you've a model with a dual-zone system fitted. Lower down, there's a USB socket too. Children will like that, and they'll appreciate the fact that these side windows have proper electric up-and-down opening, rather than the kind of fixed edge-hinged arrangement offered on some small van-paced MPVs that smaller folk tend to object to. There are cup holders back here too, but you probably won't immediately notice them because they're situated over your shoulder, one on each side of the cabin, the holder on the right side flanked by a useful 12 volt socket. And that's about it. Assuming you've gone for the kind of standard length five seat short wheelbase rifter we've been testing here. Were we to be buying this Peugeot though, we'd be tempted to pay the small amount extra for the long body style with its two extra boot mounted chairs. The fact that these sit within a spacious 4.75 meter body shape means that they can, at a pitch, be quite comfortably used by adults on short to medium length journeys. It's just another example of this Peugeot's flexibility. Right, let's finish with a look out back. Now, this massive tailgate not only takes a bit of strength to lift, but it also needs quite a lot of space to complete its raising motion. With the result that in, say, a tight multi-storey car park, you might not be able to access it at all. Aware of that, Peugeot offers a useful opening rear glass section so you can more easily throw in small bags. To be fair, we should point out that when you do get the full tailgate open, there is a benefit to it being so big, namely that it provides quite an effective canopy under which you can corral your kids if, say, you're dropping them off at school in the rain and they're getting all their bits and pieces together from the boot. 
Peugeot also says that it's one of the things that makes owners go off and do things like tailgate picnics. That sounds more like a French thing to us, but we're getting off the point and ignoring one of the key things here, namely the enormous amount of luggage room on offer. Let's take a closer look at boot space. Now, whatever way you specify this Rifter, its cargo area will be vast and the clever battery pack underfloor placement we mentioned earlier means that the capacity figures are unaltered from those of the previous combustion powered models, though there's no storage space beneath the floor in this one. But you don't really need it because even this five seat short wheelbase standard length variant can swallow 775 litres in this boot, while the lengthier wheelbase long version has a capacity of up to 1050 litres. This parcel shelf at the back can take up to 25 kilograms of weight. So, for instance, you could put the dog on top of the shopping. Fold down the three individual rear seats and up to 3,000 litres is freed up here. With a long wheelbase model, it'll be up to 4,000 litres with both the back seating rows folded. In addition, with either body style, if you're taking really long items, the front passenger seat can be folded flat, allowing items like surfboards of up to 3,050 millimetres long to be taken inside long spec models. There are two trim levels on offer, Allure Premium and GT. Both use the same 50 kilowatt hour battery, which powers a 134 bhp motor. If you want a choice of body lengths and the option of seven seats, you'll need to specify base Allure Premium spec. For that, pricing starts at just over £30,000 after deduction of the £1,500 government plug-in car grant. You'll need around £35,000 if you want a lower premium spec with the seven-seat long body shape. And this top GT model comes only in standard length, five-seat form, and costs from just under £35,000. How do those prices compare to those of this model's only two realistic direct competitors, the identically engineered Citroen e Berlingo and the Vauxhall Combo E-Life. Well, both those models will save you around £800 over the least expensive standard length E-Rifter in their cheapest forms. But then you'd have to do without a number of features that all E-Rifters get as standard. If you're looking at the long wheelbase body shape, it's worth knowing that there are base E-Berlingo and Combo E-Life variants in that form that will save you quite a lot. Again, though, if you equalised specification to the equivalent version of this Peugeot, there probably wouldn't be that much in it. Ah, yes, spec. Now, let's get to that with this Peugeot, since it seems to be so important to the value proposition here. Base Allure premium models get quite a lot. 16-inch Taranaki alloy wheels, aluminium roof bars, auto headlamps, front fog lights, power folding mirrors and opening tailgate window, dark tinted rear side and tailgate glass and Peugeot's Vizio Park package, which gives you rear parking sensors and a 180 degree reversing camera. Inside, there's a 10.1 inch digital instrument cluster and a capacitive 8 inch touchscreen featuring both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, along with Bluetooth and voice recognition. Allure Premium models also come with manual air conditioning, Puma cloth upholstery, a folding front passenger seat and a one-third, two-third folding second row bench. You get tray tables on the back of the front seats too. Upgrade yourself to this GT level of spec and you get quite a lot more. There's a smarter look for a start with a 3D stamped radiator grille, gloss black roof bars, door sill protectors with gloss black inserts and 17 inch Airaki alloy wheels. Inside this GT model, Peugeot serves up what it calls a Quente Brown interior ambience with smarter, casual, overstitched upholstery. But the major thing of note is that the second seating row is made up of three individual rear seats rather than a bench. At this level in the range, there's also keyless entry and automatic dual zone climate control. 
Key options across the range include a Zenith panoramic glass roof that floods the cabin with light, 3D navigation for the 8-inch centre screen and a tow bar. Now bear in mind that you'll also be paying Peugeot more for your choice of paint colour because the only standard shade is solid Bianca white. We've got sunset copper metallic here. What about safety? Well, across the range, the E-Rifters safety tally is reasonable. All models fitted with Peugeot's safety pack that features active lane keeping assist, active safety brake, cruise control with a speed limiter, speed limit recognition and recommendation, plus driver attention alert. As for other more conventional safety features, well, every version of this mid-sized Peugeot van-based MPV gets twin side and curtain airbags as well as twin front bags. Plus, there's ESP stability control, the usual ABS braking system with EBD or electronic brake force distribution to make it more effective. And EBA or emergency brake assistance to help in panic stops that will be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. Isofix child seat fastenings, tyre pressure monitors, anti-whiplash front head restraints, an exterior temperature ice warning light and hill start assist to stop you drifting backwards on uphill junctions also make the team sheet. Specify the optional tow bar and you'll also get a trailer sway mitigation system as well. We mentioned the WLTP rated range in our driving experience section, 172 miles. That's for this standard body length. Bear in mind that this figure drops to 166 if you go for the long length version. To give you some real-world perspective, in our time with the car over a mixture of different driving, we've been struggling to get much more than 135 miles of range between charges from this standard length version. To optimise range, you'll need to make full use of the car's regenerative braking system, regularly activating the provided B mode via the central console to maximise energy recovery during braking. You'll also want to keep an eye on the Power Eco Charge drive meter on the right of the instrument screen, keeping it out of its power section as often as possible. The selectable power flow meter, selectable for display on both cockpit screens, is also useful, briefing you in real time on power expenditure and regeneration. The centre screen has a dedicated EV section where that power flow meter sits, along with a statistics section which graphically shows your recent energy usage in miles per kilowatt hour, and a charge section which allows you to set charging times in tune with cheaper electricity rates. Ah yes, charging. What about that? Well, as you'd want, the E-Rifter supports up to 100 kilowatt rapid or DC charging with an 80% recharge taking less than 30 minutes, while a full charge from a 7.4 kilowatt single phase wall box takes seven and a half hours thanks to the 7.4 kilowatt onboard charger. Customers with access to three-phase power can specify an optional 11 kilowatt onboard charger that will charge the E-Rifter in 4 hours and 45 minutes when using a wall box that also supports this faster home charging solution. As usual, with a compact zero emissions EV model, there's a benefit in kind first year tax rate of just 1% and exemption from London congestion and ultra low emissions charges at least until 2025 anyway. Insurance is rated at 19E for an Allure Premium Standard Length variant, 20E for this GT Standard Length model and 21E for an Allure Premium Long Length version. Maintenance intervals are much as they would be for a combustion model, but there will be less for the workshop to do, so costs should be lower. There are plenty of Peugeot outlets to choose from, so you should never be too far from one. And so you can budget ahead, the French maker offers a prepaid servicing scheme that lets you pay either a one-off fee or monthly instalments to cover the cost of the routine upkeep of your car for as long as three years and 35,000 miles. The 
There must be plenty of people out there who want a family-shaped compact electric vehicle, maybe as a second car, but don't want an SUV. It would have to be realistically priced, have an acceptable driving range, and not look too van-like. The e-rifter, to our eyes anyway, ticks all these boxes. For whatever reason, with the right spec in place, there's a bit less of a whiff of LCV here than there is with this model's two Stellantis Group cousins, the Vauxhall Combo E-Life and Citroen's E-Berlingo. And if you take up the long wheelbase version's offered option of having seven seats, then this Peugeot has a big advantage over a comparably sized and probably pricier all-electric compact SUV. Plus, this Rifter can be a van if you need it to be. Jack of all trades then, a master of one, the art of bypassing fuel stations. <laughs>